Okay, Jeff, go ahead. Okay. Good evening. I'm Jeff Badnock, and on behalf of the University of Montana Alumni Association and the Community Lecture Series Committee, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the fourth lecture of the 2022 University of Montana Alumni Association Annual Community Lecture Series. This series was established more than 20 years ago as a means to give a spotlight to the many amazing faculty at work researching and lecturing on the university's campuses. The series shares with the community the cutting edge work in the arts and sciences for which the university is so well known. Like last year, we are mindful of your help and are hosting this year's lectures online via Zoom and Facebook. We all hope that next year's lectures will be before a live audience. Since this is not a ticketed event this year, the lecture series committee decided to offer the series to the public at no charge. To support this generous offering, the Lecture Series Committee is grateful to acknowledge the support of First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, Kitty Robbins, and an anonymous donation in honor of former UM President George Dennison and his wife Jane as this year's Lecture Series sponsors. If you enjoy these lectures and wish to support them now and in the future, please feel free to visit the Alumni Association website and make a donation of your own. As always, these lectures are the result of a lot of work on the part of the Community Lecture Series Committee made up of Kitty Robbins, Joe Batt, Robert Stubblefield, Chris Comer, and Peggy Cooper. Jody Moreau of the Alumni Association Office and UM student Lindsay House have provided indispensable support in the organization and production of the series. The committee has chosen for this year's series the theme, Our Environment Matters. From the waters of Montana to the wildfires of the Northwest, this year's lectures will explore human impact on environmental sustainability and how changes in the environment will affect our lives and how we live in the world. This year's series will showcase six of UM's finest professors as they share rich and exciting research happening at the University of Montana and beyond. As always, following the lecturer's presentation, there will be an opportunity for members of the audience to ask questions so that our experience can be broadened. To do that, simply click on the chat function on Zoom and submit your question. If you're watching via Facebook, post your questions or comments in the comments section. We will get to as many of those questions as we can, but we will have a clear ending point for tonight's event at no later than 8.30. As always, the lecture series has received a media assistance grant from MCAT, now housed in Missoula's wonderful new library, and they will record the lectures for later viewing. We learned today that the series will begin airing on MCAT on March 8th at 5.30 p.m. and then again Thursday, March 10th at 7 p.m. The lectures will be aired in order, one each week on the Tuesday and Thursday schedule. March 8th at 5.30 and March 10th at 7 will begin the lectures. Each of our lives is inextricably tied to the su simple substance water. For the past 50 or 60 years, our focus here in Missoula on the banks of the Clark Fork River has been water quality and cleaning the river after decades of treating it like a sewer. Now, in addition to quality, with climate change affecting regional snowpack and runoff, is it time for us to address quantity? And if quantity is an issue, how will we develop policies to allocate our water resources beneficially and equitably? There's an old saying in the West, sometimes attributed to Mark Twain, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. Here to illuminate this subject is tonight's lecturer, Brian Chafin, Associate Professor of Water Policy and Governance at the University. Professor Chafin's areas of research and teaching at the University of Montana focus on water rights, landscapes, livelihoods, and climate change, mediating values of water in Western Montana. Please join me in welcoming Professor Brian Chafin. Thanks, Jeff, for that generous introduction and welcome everybody. 
I'm thrilled to be here and honored to be asked to speak in the UM Alumni Association Community Lecture Series. First, I'd like to thank the Alumni Association and the series committee for this invitation to speak and for their hard work uh, putting together the, the series. I'd also like to start by formally recognizing that the place from which I deliver this presentation to you this evening, uh, the University of Montana campus, is located in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people, many of whom are present with us tonight. As a member of the University of Montana community, I respect and honor the path they've always shown us in caring for this place for generations to come. And I attempt to continue to learn about and engage in this history and indigenous values and integrate them into my teaching and research at the university and beyond. Here at U of M, I teach and research in the W.A. Frankie College of Forestry and Conservation, as Jeff mentioned. Our college graduates, uh, if you're not familiar with the college, become foresters, wildlife biologists, ecological scientists, and conservation professionals of all stripes. They work for federal, state, tribal agencies, as well as nonprofits and other non-governmental organizations and industry. To myself, to my colleagues in the college, to our students, and likely to most of you in attendance today, the lecture series title, Our Environment Matters, rings deeply, deeply true. And so tonight I'm gonna to talk to you about an aspect that doesn't always come to mind when you hear the words, our environment. Often, the students in, in my courses um, that I mentioned earlier, they encounter law and policy in their studies of the environment with me for the first time in real depth. I absolutely love this. It, it's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, I enjoy helping students learn to navigate the systems of law and policy that structure, for better or for worse, uh, the relationship between society and the environment through processes by which decisions are made about how we use, conserve, and preserve our environment, and particularly uh, water. So to first to untangle this web of, of law and policy, this mysterious veil, uh, as well as the rules, uh, informal, uh, such as social norms, spoken or unspoken, that shape our relationship with the environment, my teaching and research has become part history, part philosophy, part legal studies, part ecology, and part sociology, and a healthy dose of public engagement. Um, regardless of, of any of that, my favorite object of law and policy to study is, is water. It always has been water. And particularly the physical, cultural, and sometimes spiritual relationship between water and people. So tonight I'll talk a little bit about some aspects of that intersection between water law and policy, and specifically about that relationship and how it plays out here in Montana. There are a lot of different ways we could talk about water in Montana. Quality, quantity, groundwater, surface water, snowpack, the relationship with climate. But to really, oops, excuse me, uh, to really hone in on the relationship between people and water through law and policy in Montana specifically, let's start with some language in our state's grounding document. How uh, in the Montana Constitution, the original one, 1889, clearly states that the use of all water now appropriated, we'll come back to what that means, um, or hereafter appropriated. So the use of all water appropriated for a purpose, and it includes the right of way over land to get to that water and places to store that water as far as reservoirs go, shall be held to be a public use. 1889. All water in the state of Montana should be held to be of public use. How this has been interpreted is that the use of water by the people of Montana should be for the people of Montana, for, public, uh, for the public, and for public benefit. The uh, revision of the Montana Constitution in 1872 provides some additional language uh, that clarifies that Montana waters, in all various forms, belong to the state, and specifically, the language is that is the property of the state for the use of its people. And what that does is it created a series of water rights that were granted to the people of the state of Montana. And that water right is not a right to own water, not like minerals or even wildlife in some cases. Water cannot be reduced to individual possession, but instead individuals possess a right to use water for some purpose. We'll also come back to that, that purpose aspect in a minute. So what this means is that all water in the state, groundwater, atmospheric water, service runoff, springs, it's all legally held in trust by the state and use for the use of its people. For the most part, this principle has held up over time 
and really structures a body of law and policy in Montana that guides how and when citizens and businesses use water. Whether that be through extraction, such as taking water out of a stream and putting it on crops, or through what I would call in situ uses, such as being on water, being on a river for transportation, or accessing a water body for hunting and fishing activities. However, the 100 plus year efforts that ensued after Montana tried to sort out this right to use water and, and how they continue to sort out this right of the people to use water today um, and how it would be distributed across the people of Montana and enforced both on those who are already here at the time of Euro-American colonization and those that moved to Montana in the uh, wave of Western colonial expansion in the 19th, 20th centuries. This has all led to the establishment of our modern system of water rights administration in Montana and throughout the Western United States known as the system of prior appropriation. You've all likely heard the, the popular phrases that originate from the basic tenets of prior appropriation, which include first in time, first in right, or use it or lose it. Uh, you may have also heard the common phrase that Jeff uh, gave us in his introduction, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over, uh, which I actually tend to disagree with. Um, in the modern context of water in Montana. And I hope to convince you of that by the end of the talk. Um, but that's more of a, I think that uh, whiskeys for drinking and waters for fighting is more of a social commentary on the relative scarcity and economic gain of having water rights in Montana than really based in any tenets of, of prior appropriation. So we'll come back to that as well. Uh, first, let's talk about uh, what, what prior appropriation is. And um, so, by, and by doing that, let's start by describing what it is not. When the North American continent, particularly what is today the United States, uh, was first colonized by Euro-Americans, they brought with them an established body of law and policy, most from the English system, and much of that originated from Roman systems of law. With that came the first U.S. doctrine of water rights known as riparian rights. And you can see on the, the slide there that it's mostly today still in the eastern part of the United States. The word riparian is Latin for the word ripa, which means bank of the stream, and thus to have a right in the riparian rights system, you must own property that borders a water body that you wish to use. And uh, it was also based on this idea of shared use of that water body. So in other words, all owners of property on a stream um, or a water body would have rights to use that stream, but would have to share it with others. And all disputes about that sharing uh, at the time when this was first established were heard by court systems. And so whether you were a uh, manufacturing facility or a farmer or just using water for domestic production, you would have to share the water on the stream on which you own property. Early on, this wasn't a huge problem uh, because most of the precipitation in the East or because the amount of precipitation in the East and the sheer abundance of water bodies, the old adage is you couldn't throw a stone on the East Coast without hitting some sort of water. Um, so let's fast forward to colonial settlers moving to the arid West. Water bodies are more ephemeral or, and, and are more ephemeral and geographically distanced from each other, making the requirement to own land on a water body completely untenable. In addition, uh, many public land laws like the Homestead Acts and the General Mining Acts encourage settlers to extract water and use that water to obtain property rights to land and minerals. Um, so based on that hydrologic and colonial context, a new system of water rights was born in the American West and the right to use water was not tied to land. Water could be extracted from any source and put to use elsewhere. And the first person to extract that water, and I say person loosely, um, for any particular use had seniority over the initial, in the initial right system in this, of this new system of prior appropriation. They had the seniority to use the water before someone else did. And if there wasn't enough water to go around, they, the use would be backed up in, in terms of seniority. So if I was there first and there wasn't enough for you, too bad. Um, this is codified first in California and in Colorado, but adopted almost ubiquitously, as you can see in the diagram there, um, across the American West, this side of the Mississippi, or what's known as the 100th meridian that divides the United States roughly by its precipitation gradient, even though that's moving today and, and is under some, some bit of debate. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the many challenges to this new system of prior appropriation water rights. 
first there were an indigenous people living here and all over the United States, uh, spe specifically the Western United States, and using water, uh, and they were not able to gain rights under the new system. In our region in particular, the Salish and Kalispell people had and have intimate knowledge of the relationship with water bodies across what we call today Montana. And the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes are working diligently to preserve indigenous knowledge about these historic relationships with the landscape and particularly with water bodies. This graphic from the tribes depicts the place names and the translated meanings of specific places in the Bitterroot and Upper Clark Fork basins. But in early versions of prior appropriation, these places and associated uses were not solidified as rights under the system, although not a remedy for past colonization and the genocide of native peoples. To some degree today, uh, native water rights in the system of prior appropriation has had some positive developments, which I'll talk a little bit more in some, in, uh, some slides down the road here. The second major challenge was that the system of prior appropriation was meant to support colonial settlers moving west to populate the territories so that these territories could eventually be admitted as states to the union. And thus, beneficial uses of water were first defined as almost purely extractive, irrigation of crops, water for mining, domestic use, stock water, water for industry. These were the, the things that prior appropriation privileged under its system of water rights. Under this new system, leaving water in stream was considered a waste, considered wasteful. And any water left in stream was generally considered free for allocation or claim by someone else. To a large degree, this has led to the distribution of surface water and groundwater use we see in Montana today, which is depicted on the slide. In 2015, the US Geological Survey estimated that a total of about 9.8 billion gallons of water per day are withdrawn from Montana's streams and aquifers um, for the eight categories of water use that you see there. Most of that water, 96%, goes to the irrigation of crops, including vegetables, grains, hay, and alfalfa. Also in 2015, it was estimated that 2.5 million acres in Montana were irrigated. Surface water withdrawals totaled um, about 99% of that irrigation and groundwater withdrawals supported about 1% of it. So most of our irrigation in Montana is done by um, surface irrigation. Now, this, this focus on agriculture isn't a bad thing. I'm not trying to paint it as a bad thing. Agriculture is the lead, leading industry in Montana, makes up about 5% of our state GDP, roughly about 10% of the labor force. It's an economic engine. And the system of water rights that was originally built to privilege agriculture and mining uh, has caused some challenges when it comes to valuing our environment and other roles that water plays within the environment in relation to society. So there's, there's some tension because of that original purpose, and I'll, and I'll get into that. That leads to the challenge that I wanna spend the remainder of the talk on today. The idea that many of the surface water streams in Montana are what's known as chronically or periodically dewatered. Simply put, these are streams that see flows reduced by man-made depletions and either regularly or periodically, and they at time cannot support native fisheries or other forms of aquatic life. Now there isn't a legal definition of chronic or periodically dewatered, um, but the data you see there is data from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks that used um, biological indicators to determine whether there wasn't enough water in a stream at a certain period of time to support um, aquatic life. This image depicts visually what I mean by dewatered. The, the left image depicts the upper Clark Fork River just south of Deer Lodge in this past summer, July 2021. And the right image uh, depicts the same spot after an experimental release of stored water from Silver Lake, west of Anaconda, Montana. Uh, this effort was pursued by Trout Unlimited, the Natural Resource Damage Program, uh, Atlantic Richfield, and the Butte Silver Boat County to address dewatering uh, during the hot, dry months of the Upper Clark Fork River in August and September. And so I use this, even though one is actually later than the other, I just use this image to show you the, the drastic difference between a stream that's considered dewatered and, and a stream that has um, marginally adequate flow in it. So, so you can see that. So what's going on? Are there just too many straws in the streams or are there other things at play here? Uh, the historic allocation of water rights and modern demands on agriculture are not 100% to blame. Um, for the challenge of dewatered streams in Montana, but they provide a strong foundation uh, for the challenge. A change in climate, including rising average temperatures throughout the seasons, and a connection 
excuse me, and a connection uh, to the timing and amounts of distribution of that precipitation are uh, an exacerbating problem. Let's take the historic high summer temperatures of 2021 as an example. By June 22nd last year, early in the growing season, very early in the growing season, 91% of the state was classified as abnormally dry due to extreme and or abnormally dry to extreme drought conditions, prompting farmers and ranchers across the state to respond to lo low soil moisture conditions by increasing irrigation water applications across the state. In addition, our natural water storage mechanism in the state, snowpack, went from average or just below average at the beginning of June to a depleted state by mid-June. So you can see here um, how we measure snow in the mountains. Uh, our snow water equivalent or the equivalent of water in our snowpack uh, was being measured across the western part of the state as fairly average. You know, the green means that it's around uh, a normal percent or around an average percent of normal. And then the orange is just a little below, but not depleted. And then the red is almost entirely depleted or severely depleted. And so you can see just in 15 days, the hot temperatures that we had early in June last year really took down our, our storage of water. This trend has been documented over the last 50 years by climate scientists in Montana and across many parts of the West. And the change in distribution and volume of snowpack is predicted to increase in the near future, trending towards uh, less snowpack with an earlier melt period in most places, in most places, excuse me. So Montana's biggest surface water and policy challenges, in my opinion. On top of an uncertain supply and highly allocated streams in Montana, there's a changing demand for how Montana actively values and uses water and how Montanans actively value and use water. People are moving here, population is growing. COVID-19 has initiated an exodus from cities by those who can work remotely. Many of these new users generally have a strong preference for surface water streams with healthy fish populations and enough water to recreate in and on, which at times can be incompatible with agriculture extraction of water for irrigation, especially during times of drought. There is no wholesale one size fits all pathway under our system of prior appropriation to address this conflict between legally allocated water that has senior water rights um, and water and, and is often water extracted for off-stream use and this kind of demand for leaving water in stream. In addition, the challenge does not present evenly across the landscape. It varies in space and time and it's difficult to manage at different points across the state. Although I don't necessarily wanna call it a conflict, uh, and it, this, if we were to call it a conflict, it doesn't manifest in every basin across Montana, nor is it an insurmountable challenge. The major drivers that I listed on the last slide are pushing in uncertainty in supply and demand and are setting up potential future challenges between extracting water for agriculture and keeping water in stream for fisheries and recreation, especially given significant shifts in the timing, distribution, and quantity of water supplies as we we view and, and understand more our changing climate. Um, agriculture and recreation, and I will use recreation here as, as driving in stream value, values, especially uh, fishing, tourism, recreation, but that's not the only uh, driver, are two of the biggest e economies in the state. Often they transform uh, surface waters as a venue for potential conflict, collaboration, or both. But what's not captured in this narrative is that there's other physical and legal priorities for in-stream flows, including for federally listed endangered species of fish and species of cultural and sub subsistence significance to the eight federally recognized tribes in Montana, as well as flows for habitat that are implicated in treaty rights with those tribes to hunt, fish, and gather in usual and accustomed places, as well as explicit protections in tribal water rights settlements. Needless to say, many livelihoods are at stake in this challenge and the uncertainty surrounding supply and demand necessitates a suite of approaches that may stretch beyond the current processes of prior appropriation law and policy. Montana identified long ago that prior appropriation produced challenges to balancing changing uses and values over water in Montana. And the legislature and agencies took some proactive steps to address this. In 1969, the Montana legislature enacted legislation granting the Montana Fish and Game Commission the authority to appropriate unappropriated waters, so waters that, that weren't already allocated under, under their, or had a senior water right on them, or they may have had a senior water right, but they weren't fully allocated, their flows, on 12 streams 
uh, to maintain in-stream flows for the preservation of fish and wildlife habitat. These are known as the Murphy rights, and you may have heard of some of those streams before. They include the Blackfoot River, part of the Blackfoot River near Missoula, <clears throat> and in Powell County. Excuse me, real quick, I'm sorry. As well as the uh, <clears throat> parts of the Flathead River, the Middle Fork of the Flathead, South Fork of the Flathead, and the Gallatin River near Bozeman. Ah, ooh, excuse me. Um, these these are known as Murphy rights uh, after the because they're named after the representative James E. Murphy who sponsored the measure. Following in 1973, uh, the Montana Legislature passed the Montana Water Use Act. In addition to completely reorganizing reorganizing the water rights filing system in Montana, uh, it, for example, you now had to apply for a water right instead of just claiming one. It codified in-stream flow as a legal beneficial use, allowing the state to appropriate in-stream flow reservations. And so before this, before 1973, leaving water and stream didn't have a, a legal standing under the water rights system, but after 1973, it did. Uh, the State uh, Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks was the main agency charged with um, allocating those in-stream flow reservations at the time. In 1989, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks gained the authority to lease and convert other water rights into in-stream flow rights. And in 1995, this was extended, this leasing provision was extended to include private third parties. Now, I'm using this word in-stream flow right. What, what is an in-stream flow right? An in-stream flow right is an amount of water usually measured as a flow rate. So an amount of water per time you may have heard of the term CFS or cubic feet per second, which is how many of our rivers are, are gauged or how, how we measure uh, flow and then volume in our rivers. But it's measured at a certain point. And so an in-stream flow right would say, for example, that this right has 100, needs 100 CFS at this point over this period of time, and it has a priority date of, for example, 1910. And so it fits in a system of prior appropriation water rights by having that uh, amount, timing, as well as uh, a, a priority date. So it can be compared with other extractive uses for water. So we, like many other states, benefit from an established series of in-stream flow rights in Montana. And I've depicted them here on the slide. Problem solved, right? We have in-stream flow rights. They protect our in-stream flow. And uh, we, we should be able to balance extracted water and, and water in-stream. Not exactly. Uh, we do have the legal tools to protect in-stream flow in Montana and even to change the beneficial use of existing rights, and for example, rights for irrigation, uh, to in-stream flow to keep priority dates intact. However, as many of us, I'm sure many, many of us on the call know, uh, the administrative process to change this makes it extremely difficult to change a beneficial use and especially one in a he heavily irrigated basin. In addition, the current set of in-stream flow rights in Montana is generally junior and at times very junior to agricultural rights, and they're unequally distributed uh, across streams and tributaries, especially those that are chronically dewatered or are in need of protection for ecological, cultural, spiritual, or other recreational values. In addition, not all of our established in-stream flow rights are being met. So these are, this is due to reasons, as I mentioned earlier, such as being junior. <clears throat> Here is a, just a list of all of the in-stream flow rights that I showed on the, last, on the last slide. And the percentage of them that are being met all the time is around 50, so it's pretty good. But there's still about 50% of our in-stream flow rights that at some point during the year are not meeting their, uh, their all allocated or their, the amount of the in-stream flow right. So I began to ask the question in my research is, can we learn anything from the relationship between this distribution of in-stream flow water rights in the state, the demand for water for irrigated agriculture, and the location of the biggest stream flow challenges of these chronically dewatered streams across the state? That's the question that I continue to work with um, through various avenues of both geospatial data analysis uh, as seen here, as well as talking, actually going out on the ground and talking with water users, um, both those that extract water for irrigated agriculture and those that um, use water for more in situ uses for recreation and fisheries habitat. 
I'll draw your attention quickly to the figure on the far right. Um, this is this is a figure uh, that shows both the irrigated area of basins. So it shows in the darker colors which of the basins in Montana have the heaviest irrigated uh, acre, or sorry, heavy, heaviest amount of irrigated acreage. And the red dots are irrigation water rights demand. So these are places where um, water rights demand is volumetrically the biggest. And so a place that's dark and has a big red circle are challenging places um, for uh, the, we will call the over allocation of, of water rights um, based on the amount of stream flow. So what do we know? Um, anecdotally, many, I'm sure many listening today as well as myself know that how this distribution translates on the, on the landscape. We know that we have dewatered streams that impact fisheries. We know that there are things being done about it. There's shared sacrifice about around by many water users. There's voluntary drought plans that are happening in different basins across the state. There are calls on water rights. So a senior user will call a junior user at times of shortage and some people will not be able to, to irrigate because of a lack of, of supply. There's highly contested applications to change water rights from irrigated agricultural beneficial uses to in-stream flow. Shifts in ownership of large agricultural properties are happening across the state. And so we're seeing uh, values change. I anecdotally heard, and I can't confirm this, that in Southwest Montana during the pandemic, that there were a single digit percentage of agricultural land uh, transactions that were staying in agriculture. Most, uh, basically the sale of, of ranches and large agricultural properties were not um, staying in production or they're being bought by non-ranching uh, families. So that's happening across the state, which will change the dynamics and water rights. There's a decrease in agricultural productivity. Um, if there's a decrease in agricultural productivity, productivity will have economic impacts across the state. And there's, there's litigation that's happening around our water rights. Now, it's not doom and gloom. I don't want to paint that picture. Um, but we, anecdotally, what this adds up to is, even though we don't have a system of in-stream flow rights that cover the needs of um, fisheries and other aquatic habitat across the state, we know where the challenges lie. And there's more. Uh, we also know that there are potential solutions to these challenges emerging on the landscape organically and also in neighboring states at a variety of scales. There's things like water markets that are allowing people to trade water rights uh, freely on a, on a short term or limited use basis. There's uh, different forms of water train, uh, trading. There are retirements of water rights and uh, there's water leasing and compensation programs that include both short term and temporary or what's known as split season leasing, where you use your water rights during part of the season, and then you lease it during another season for a, a compensation or a cash payment. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that for the remainder of my talk. So I'll, I'll use today to, to talk about the research that I'm doing in this area. Uh, I'll use the Upper Clark Fork River. There's a lot of work going on in the Upper Clark Fork, and I, I want to recognize that there's a lot of work that has been going on in the Upper Clark Fork for probably the last 50 years. Um, and, and really intensely in the last 20 or 30 um, because of the unique history of this section of, of river and its tributaries here in Montana. The Upper Clark Fork above its confluence, the Little Blackfoot, contains 130 miles of chronically dewatered streams. Uh, additionally, over 100 miles of that is actually on the main stem Clark Fork and is classified as, as chronically dewatered. Um, and it spans four counties from the communities of Galen to Tura. This persistent dewatering is detrimental to aquatic ecosystems and is a major limiting factor to fisheries and aquatic restoration of, of compromised river miles from the mining contamination described in the, as the largest complex of Superfund states in the, or sorry, co complex of Superfund sites in the country. And you can see here, as I move this slide, a picture of what's known as the Slicken, uh, a contaminated uh, parcel of land from the the tailings that were moved by the flood, the early flood in the 1900s that um, really changed the landscape through deposition of, of toxic heavy metals. And we also know that, that they uh, continually, not everywhere, but continually are disturbed by changing river flows. In addition, persistent drought, large scale climatic variations and water extracted from irrigation are major drivers of low flows and stream dewatering in the upper Clark Fork. Numerous other basins in Montana struggle with similar issues, and the severity of dewatering in the Upper Clark Fork is unique in its magnitude and scale. 
For example, in 2016, stream flows were measured at 2.6 cubic feet per second. 2.6. If you know anything about that flow, it's very small amount. It's it's just not very much bigger than this when you see it flowing through the stream. And that was on the main stem of the Clark Fork River near Racetrack Creek. Um, and that represents a drainage area of nearly a thousand square miles above it. Um, in addition to that, this this past year, a similar measurement was taken on on the same area that was around 15 CFS. So I have a lot of partners on this research, uh, the Natural Resource Damage Program and the Clark Fork Coalition. They're both interested specifically on the potential of split season or short-term leasing and compensation for senior water rights holders as just one of a suite of viable approaches in the basin to increasing uh, stream flow during times of drought or low flow in the late summer months. Oop, forgot to show you this picture of the, uh, the super fun warnings. Uh, on some of this area. In addition, uh, another a demand on the river is that in, in the, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, they co-manage now a 1905 in-stream flow right uh, measured at the Tura gauge, so just upstream of, um, uh, upstream of Missoula and upstream of Bonner on the Clark Fork River. And, and this is a result of a recently negotiated reserve water rights compact and settlement agreement which either FWP, the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, or the tribes will be able to unilaterally make call on as a senior water right holder uh, as early as 2025. This research, my research that I'm doing, is not directly tied uh, or related to that in-stream flow right, but it really underscores the general need to find water in the upper Clark Fork for in-stream flow during low periods, not only to support fisheries and aquatic habitat upstream, but also to support the tribe's management of their in-stream flow right for the protection of bull trout habitat specifically, which is a uh, culturally significant species, as noted by the place names um, at the mouth of the Blackfoot River, known as the place of the large bull trout, and the mouth of the Rattlesnake Creek near, in Missoula, it's the place of the small bull trout. This presence of a co-owned, co-managed tribal water right on the upper Clark Fork brings me to another really important point of prior appropriation water law and history, and part of the story that I would be remiss not to share with you tonight. Um, and it's partly about the development of prior appropriation, not only in Montana, but across the Western US. But interestingly, it, it has its foundations here in Montana. In 1908, the Supreme Court heard a landmark water case about the use of the Milk River by the people of the Fort Belknap Reservation in North Central Montana. The key questions of this case were, did the establishment of this Native American reservation and the treaty between the Indians of Fort Belknap and the US government, did this implicitly reserve water rights for the existence of the reservation and its people, as well as to satisfy all agreements codified in the treaty? Uh, in short, the answer was yes. And it's a resounding yes across the Western United States and all of the US today. And at this point, Native American water, reserved water rights were established. Now it took a little while to get to the point where these have been uh, negotiable and enforceable in state water law, um, the, the first time that they were, they were codified in any specific amounts was in a Supreme Court case in the 1960s. But when we hear about the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes Compact, Water Compact, this Supreme Court decision and the establishment of reserved water rights is the foundation to why the tribes have a legal and legitimate claim to water rights, not only on the reservation, but across, um, across the Western United States. Before the compact, these were all the potential claims, um, and not potential, but these were all the actual claims that the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes had to water that was used for traditional um, uses such as hunting, fishing, and gathering across Western Montana. Under a non-compact scenario, all of these water rights could have been uh, adjudicated in the individual basins and potentially litigated. But the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes gave up many of these rights in exchange for some specific key cultural uh, significant rights on tributaries outside of the reservation and in enhanced rights of, for water inside the reservation. And so these Native American water rights settlements, not only with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, but with the Blackfeet, the Crow, and tribes all across the West, I believe 37 in total now, are ways that Native American tribes are asserting water rights in systems of prior appropriation within states uh, to increase their sovereignty over water. Um, 
but they're they're not doing it in a vacuum. You know, instead of instead of litigating these rights, which could take 30, 40 plus years um, to happen, they're, they've made concessions in order to co-manage and to um, to coexist with um, the the people that are using water around these places today. So. How did I, let's go back to the Clark Fork for a minute because this all kind of revolves around the challenges of the Clark Fork. Um, what was the process of, of kind of getting this research started and what was I gonna look at on the Clark Fork? Um, and so I, we kind of designed a study in coordination with uh, the Clark Fork Coalition and funded by the Natural Resource Damage Program um, to look at one possibility of increasing flow in these, these challenging times of, of chronic dewatering um, on the Clark Fork. And one of those ways is this idea of the short-term lease. And so we, the question that we're answering is, can short-term water leasing be an option to address dewatering in the upper Clark Fork? And the, the study kind of has three phases. I reviewed existing short-term leasing programs in other states, uh, establish, we wanted to establish a systematic and data-driven approach to target water rights uh, for potential split season leasing project. And then wanted to talk to people survey water users' views and on water leasing and related social and economic considerations. We'll basically ask the question, will this work? Um, so our first phase, and I, I apologize about just the, uh, the writing here on the slide. I couldn't think of any pretty pictures to show off our literature review. Um, but uh, we found that from a review of other states and peer-reviewed literature, leases can be critical tools for enhancing in-stream flow because they provide flexibility for both buyers and sellers and they allow for a review of impacts on the flow and agricultural production. So if you do a short-term lease, you don't buy out the water, right? But you just do it for one season or you do it for one part of the season, you can monitor it. We can gather data about how it works. Um, many Western states, including Washington, Utah, Colorado, uh, Oregon, Nevada, they allow for some form of temporary leasing of agricultural water rights for in-stream flow. And Colorado and Oregon have the most robust and state-supported programs that includes state-level funding. Although some states have authorized and provided legal frameworks for such programs, most transactions involve uh, NGOs or conservation organizations as funders, transaction shepherds, and also for monitoring. Uh, private funding is the most common source of a, of a water lease payments, but some states, like as I mentioned, Colorado and, and, and Oregon, they provide year-to-year -year funding for programs such as this. Payment amounts for short-term water leases vary widely. I've seen figures that in Montana up to 2015, they've varied from $2 an acre feet, uh, $2 an acre foot to $25 an acre foot. But in our literature view across the West, we saw $2 an acre foot all the way to $377 an acre foot. So uh, a huge range in what people would pay for water. And, and as a, just a quick note, an acre foot of water is picture one acre of land covered in one foot of water. And that's the volumetric measurement of an acre foot. Um, valuations for these lease, valuation methods for these short-term water leases are not consistent, but the transaction history suggests that local competing demand for water increases prices and contexts such as the productiveness of the land, the volume of the water, the priority date, as well as the distance to an urban center are all critical factors in, in um, expanding or increasing these values. So the second phase of our study, we intended to identify some actual water rights in three target sub-basins of the Upper Clark Fork, uh, Gold Creek, Lost Creek, and Flint Creek. And I'll talk a little bit about Gold Creek and Lost Creek today. These are all three, these are three drainages that have potential to be candidates for split season leasing uh, because they have, they have senior water rights. They have some of the, the water rights holders on the streams have relatively large water rights. And they're, they're all relatively close in some areas to the, the main stem Clark Fork. And so, we can, without knowing the soil type, without knowing the, the dynamics of the soil and the sh shallow subsurface groundwater flow, we know that some of the water, that if it's not used for irrigation, it will get to the Clark Fork. So these, those were key considerations. Um, the other key criteria for evaluating these water rights was, are, are, you know, are they, are they uh, old and what is their duty? And we explain this word of duty is, is the volume that's put on um, the acreage uh, a, a good ratio. So is it a large volume of water per acreage dried up? So I, the first task uh, was to work with the massive Montana water rights database, publicly available information that you can, that any of us can go on and log on and find information about all the claimed water rights here in Montana. 
I believe that there's over 4 million lines of code or, or lines of, of records about water rights here in Montana. So I promptly outsourced this to a graduate student. Um, and I, 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 I kid a little bit, but only sort of. And I should really recognize the work of Anna Crockett, who now works for the Forest Service uh, in Hamilton, uh, for the massive amount of hours she put in wrangling this database. But uh, the bottom line is we, we took the information from this, this database and the, word, the, the words POD and POU there are two different layers in the database geospatially that are point of diversion for a water right and place of use for a water right. So think about where the water is diverted from the stream and actually where it's used. And we had to join those, um, but we also had to make decisions about what to keep and what to remove uh, in order to, to, to get a usable database. And this is kind of what the database looks like. So there's, a, there's an example of the database and it's uh, geospatial information uh, in, a, in a county in Northeast Montana, just because this is a really, really easy county to show you kind of what this looks like. Um, and all of the blue dots on the left, those are all the water rights or potential water rights in that basin. But many of them are retired. Many of them are, are lines of code that are, are old water rights that have been combined into a different water right. Many of them are, are too junior to be used. Some of them are stock watering. Some of them are duck ponds, things that don't exactly uh, work for the, the water rights that we're interested in for irrigated agriculture that are coming off the stream. So we were able to call that database down to get to the set of water rights that were, um, that were really important. And then the red dots you see there are the um, irrigation points of diversion uh, from canals. So that come off of the, the, main, um, the main stem of the, of the river there. So after that, uh, we calculated volumes and flow rates per acre for every water right that was in the database. And we valued, uh, evaluated the water rights by the categories that I mentioned earlier, priority date, location, volume, and duty. And there you can see the map of, um, of both Flint Creek at the top here, uh, and then Gold and Lost Creeks as well. So here's what we found. Uh, of the amount of flow that comes out of those tributaries, you can see Gold Creek and Lost Creek here, we were able to, to map where the priority dates were. How old were these water rights on the stream? And there were some water rights that were a little bit junior to 1940, but we didn't include those here because honestly, they were probably too junior to, to have gotten water in the last 30 or plus years. Uh, and so the majority of the water rights were uh, in, in Gold Creek were in the 1910, and then the majority of the ones in Lost Creek are much older. You can see 1860, 1870, and 1880. Obviously, targeting these old water rights would be preferable in a, in a split season or short-term leasing program and would ensure that leased water is not jeopardized by calls from other users. Um, in addition, we started to organize water rights into owner groups to, to actually understand who, and this gets tricky, and, and this might actually make some people out there uncomfortable that were like, what are you doing looking at our water rights? And we did this all confidentially to start out with, and we removed the names of the owners, but it is public information. And it's not that there's anything that I or anyone else can do with these water rights, but this might help somebody who is interested in a water lease actually target and make a connection at some point with somebody who could have a, a, a valuable water lease. Um, and so this is a way to kind of bring buyers and sellers together. Um, as you can see in the Lost and Gold Creeks, the number of owners with the most water is relatively few. And in small tributaries like this, identifying potential rights might be easier in this way. Also, those owners might be more willing and likely to participate because of the size and flexibility of their operation, uh, given the, the fact that they may have multiple water rights and they may have maybe a parcel that doesn't necessarily need to be irrigated for a second cutting. Um, it might not be as productive as some of their other fields. So they might be able to lease that out and dry that operation up for a part of the season in order to, for a cash or, or financial payment. Um, smaller operations also might be more interested in participating in this from a financial standpoint, just depending on kind of where they are in their, um, in their operation. So the next thing we did was we went ahead and, and geospatially oriented this. We looked at uh, the owner groups and where they are on the stream. This is a, this is a, a excuse me, a, a view of Gold Creek from the air. And these are where our own, owner groups are. And then we looked at their water rights as far as size. So you can see the darker blue are kind of the bigger 
um, or higher duty water rights. And then we looked at it in terms of priority date. And you can see here that the darkest green ones are the oldest priority dates. And putting all three of those things together for kind of this data-driven approach, we were able to, to map how close folks were to the upper Clark Fork um, and how big their duty of water was, so how much water per acre they had and what their priority date was. And so you can see on the x-axis here that you have a priority date. You can see that you have the distance from the uh, main stem of the upper Clark Fork. And you can see that the bigger that the circle, the, the higher the duty of water and the more desirable it would be to bring water to the upper Clark Fork as, as in-stream flow in a water lease. And so I've circled there the general areas of the graph that would help us uh, kind of get to that solution. One also, one, another thing that also came up uh, in these is using this information, we were able to identify some of the major uh, diversion areas in, in these, uh, specifically in Lost Creek, some of the major canals that came out of this. So this is an interesting artifact of this process we might be able to use in other basins um, to, to see where water is being taken out and where the biggest challenges are for chronic dewatering. So the last phase of this, uh, currently in progress, uh, I'm working to distribute an online survey and having in-depth conversations with producers in the basin to better understand potential interest or not in these short-term or split-season leasing agreements, uh, both in the basin and as well as just that, that opportunity in general. We're starting to learn a lot about factors for valuing leases and specifically in this basin in the region, as well as hesitations for programs like this that may be perceived to compromise sustainability of agriculture. Um, there, I'll, I'll say this, there's been, I've talked to a lot of folks and I, and I had hoped to have some data available to show you tonight, but I'm just not there yet and ready to share some of these narratives. We need to talk to a few more people, um, but there's a lot of interest in this program, but there's also a lot of hesitation. And I think it, it comes down to the idea that um, there's worry that agriculture won't be a sustainable and li uh, livelihood in the future in some of these, these basins. And that um, if a, an agriculturalist, an irrigator, leased out part of their, their fields towards the late season in the summer months, that they'd be expected to do that year after year. And there's also some misunderstanding about will they actually get paid a um, reasonable or, or sufficient uh, compensation for their, their water. And so all that said, there's a communication challenge here. And um, so I've been working with uh, the, the Natural Resource Damage Program, the Clark Fork Coalition, Fish, Wildlife and Parks, Irrigators, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, uh, the Atlantic Richfield Corporation, and many, many other folks in a series of dialogues around flow in the upper basin. Um, my approach to this research is not just from a data-driven standpoint, but it's also from a participatory standpoint. So I've been active in facilitating groups and having conversations around a suite of, of uh, potential options that can be deployed in chronically dewatered streams and particularly in the upper Clark Fork here in order to um, address some of these issues in the future. As I mentioned earlier, there's no one size fits all solution. And it's going to take, um, even though folks say all the time, we've been in these rooms for 20 years and, and nothing's really happened. Um, it's gonna take an, uh, us staying in these rooms and a next generation of ideas and innovations uh, to get to a place where the sustainability of agriculture is ensured, we have enough water and streams for aquatic habitat and all values, including those of indigenous people and their values of water and, and um, culturally significant species are managed and in a, in a reasonable way and, and valued equally across the board. And I think that that can happen under a, a system of, of prior appropriation as we've seen in other states. And so I'll leave you today. Uh, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions. I already see a few in the chat. Um, I'll leave you today with uh, that little bit of hope. And also, um, yeah, I'll just leave you there with that little bit of hope that, that there, there are things that are happening and can happening um, under the guise of, of prior appropriations and under the guidance of prior appropriation that doesn't necessitate a, whole, a wholesale change in the system, um, but can, that can allow us to, to operate in, a, in, a, in many different compromises and, and, um, and positive ways forward. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Well, um, Brian, that was 
fascinating. And like all of our lectures, um, way more than a, a single person could digest in one sitting. Um, but I thought it was really, really fascinating. Um, one of the things that I had a question about was how much participation um, are you getting from state agencies? And specifically, I'm thinking of DNRC um, and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. How do they um, relate to what you're doing? How do they regard what you're doing? And how do they feel about it? Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate the question. Um, I want to, before I get to the question, I, I always forget to advance to my last slide. Uh, and so, so I just want to say thanks, and I really want to recognize my partners and, and many of those partners that you just mentioned, um, and, and also the hard work of, of uh, some graduate students and undergraduate students on this, this research, uh, as well as funding from uh, National Science Foundation and the Montana Water Center and the Natural Resource Damage Program. Um, so your question, if I get it right, is uh, what's the response for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, DNRC? Um, the state agencies is is mostly your your interest. Yep, it's it's great. They're they're all willing partners at the table, and and honestly, they're the ones that brought me to the table. Um, they were they were very much interested in uh, making a partnership here to uh, to utilize some of the research that we were doing to utilize some of the uh, maybe not utilize the graduate student labor, but know that that we have the ability to get some things done, and we have some uh, a real uh, geospatial. Um, powerhouse here at the University of Montana, both um, some in my lab, but in many labs across the, the, the uh, university, including the climate office. And so utilizing that, um, but also um, thinking a little differently and outside the box about how we do things. I think the Upper Clark Fork Stream Flow Group is a great example of uh, just trying to think about how we take small projects and move the needle forward. For example, uh, it would be great if we could get to a place this summer where we have uh, a pilot lease. So one of these short-term leases is somewhere in the upper Clark Fork that we can monitor and um, have kind of a case study to say, look, we did this. We had a data-driven approach to get to the place that we want to get. We had a conversation with a willing landowner. We came to an agreement, uh, a reasonable agreement. We did it. We monitored it. Here's what worked. Here's what didn't work. And we're taking kind of that approach to a variety of pilot projects that are outside and inside that that arena. Well, it seems to me if I were if I were doing it, that's kind of the way um, I would want to do it. Um, see where everybody's coming to the table, something to gain and um, something to contribute. Um, back to the um, other question of climate and climate change. If we continue to see um, declining snowpack year after year, if we see um, like that two week period in June that you showed the picture of where it went from everything's fine to everything is red alert uh, in a two week period with our, with our uh, melt off, um, it seems to me that making those kinds of agreements are going to be something that people are just going to hold on to until they have an idea of how much water is there going to be. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point, Jeff. Um, one of the things that we're asking currently in our survey is we're, we're pinging people, we're gauging them on the idea of like, what kind of agreements would be best for you? So would you, if you were interested in potentially um, and I noticed there's a question in the chat, so I'll kind of go into this a little bit. When I say kind of drying up or reducing use, this would be picture a, a, a far, an irrigator, uh, generally a rancher who is also growing alfalfa or hay for, as cattle feed. Um, maybe they have three fields, maybe they have four fields. And one of them, for a second cutting, they decide not to use a water right on. And we would then, or somebody, whether it be the state, whether it be an NGO, would enter into a, a lease and compensation agreement to buy that water for that period of time and then um, and compensate the irrigator for that, but allow that flow not to, not to go on the field as irrigation, but to go directly to the stream, right? So that, that, and I may not have described that well earlier. And so one of the things we're doing in that survey, Jeff, is, is asking folks, what kind of agreement do you want? Do you wanna set that agreement in January? 
or would you rather wait till July when it is a drought condition? And you know, you, like when when would the timing of that um, that work the best for you? Do you know financially that nah, this has always kind of been a marginal field, and so if I can get a cash payment for that water up front in January, I'd rather do that. Um, but if I, I or maybe I I nope, I really want that and need that for my operation, so I'm going to do that in July if I really get into a pinch. And so this information is really going to help the state uh, NGOs. They're going to help them design a program that works the best for not only the needs of the of the stream uh, for things like fisheries habitat and aquatic habitat, but also for the agriculture community. There, I'll, I'll also mention that there. Um, uh, no, I'll skip there. I'll stop there. Maybe I'll come up with another question. Well, then it just goes back to another question, and just to make sure I got myself clear on the answer. If there is a, a landowner, an agricultural user who's willing to go into the agreement, who's he making the agreement with? Who's who's on the other side of the deal, and and how is the um, how is the the funding for that? Where does the money for that come from? Yeah, gr great, great question. And so I want to be clear that none of that is laid out right now in in um, in state statute in any kind of rules or regulations, but it uh, it's possible under the law. So a, a lease, a short-term water lease is legal under the law. The buyers and sellers are, are optional. So it could be um, an, a conservation organization that's interested in bringing water to that they could provide the money. Um, it could be a state agency. In the, in the case of the Clark Fork, it's a really interesting case because there are restoration needs because of the Superfund damages that have happened to the Clark Fork River. And so there is a larger pot of money due to um, the Superfund settlement there that could be used for things like that, specifically from natural resource damage program. And so it's a, the Clark Fork is a little bit different than other parts of the state, whereas maybe DNRC as the water administrator or FWP as the in-stream flow administrator in other parts of the state may not have that bucket of cash or a bucket of cash to work with there. And so there's a lot of potential here for um, private party, private party transactions, or there's potential for the, the state to actually think uh, in the future about creating a water fund, much like Colorado has. Colorado has um, a, a fund for um, compensating uh, water users or irrigator, irrigators for um, leasing water in times of drought or times of scarcity in certain target regions. And so that there are state funds in, in other places like Colorado and Oregon, but there's uh, Oregon's a great example of a state uh, transaction shepherd. They have a they have a program where the state kind of shepherds transactions, but most of the money that funds those is from conservation organizations that are interested in seeing streams rewatered. Right. Well, I think a lot of us uh, who live in Missoula would be happy if there were uh, more water in the Blackfoot and uh, we had for our, for recreation. And I'm speaking selfishly because um, I think that um, being able to recreate on Montana streams is one of the principal benefits of living here. Um, and when we have the low flow streams or, or um, the season of floating on uh, the Smith River is such that you have no sense going after the 1st of July. Um, it just seems to me it, this work when you're as you're completing it, is this creating a model to be used across the state um, or are you just keeping it to the, the Western drainages? Yeah, gr great question. Um, I want, because you mentioned the Blackfoot, I, I wanna also reemphasize this to the, the people listening is that this short-term or split season leasing idea, it's not new and it's also not a silver bullet, right? It's just one of a suite. And you mentioned the Blackfoot. And the Blackfoot is, is well known for their voluntary drought program or voluntary drought mitigation program where um, water users in the Blackfoot have uh, voluntary drought uh, plans that they implement on their properties when the Blackfoot River reaches a certain in-stream flow level. At a certain point, they'll, they'll implement different aspects of their drought plans. And so there are other ways, and there's a lot of basins out there that are doing this voluntary shared shortage model. And so I just want to emphasize that doesn't work everywhere, right? It doesn't, there are some places that, um, that uh, uh, f farming and ranching is, is very economically thin. And um, if a, a shared shortage agreement was to be put in place, then families and ranchers could go under, right? And so th there's, there's different ways to reach uh, uh, different people in different drainages. That said, 
Uh, I think that this research and the data-driven approach that we took to identify places and make it use the, the geospatial information in the water rights database to make it easy for the state, for NGOs, for other people to quickly identify a, a set of users in uh, a drought or low flow condition and uh, negotiate conversations about potentially brokering a, a lease um, for a, small, a short period of time to enhance the flow in emergency situations or proactively before the season starts. So I do think it's, it's uh, something that can be used in other parts. Great. Um, one of the things that you touched on, I think, early in your presentation was the role that the Confederated uh, Salish Kootenai tribes played uh, in establishing, you know, their water rights, beginning with their claim to water rights, literally across Montana, and their willingness to give up their rights to solidify their uh, interests closer to the reservation. Um, and I know that during the uh, negotiations for the um, compact that they that they negotiated, that they had provided a great deal of data with respect to uh, fisheries and uh, water. And did you have occasion to use any of their data in your work? Um, not on this particular project. My uh... My, I had a graduate student that did, that did some um, research and, and water modeling work up in um, up near the reservation um, in the Flathead Basin. And so you used a little bit of the past, but I'll just emphasize what you said. Uh, their, their water department, their natural resources and water department is incredible. The amount of information that they've collected and, and generally just the, the good neighborly um, approach that they've taken to negotiating their claims and the water compact from its inception in the 1970s to the 2015 passage to the 2021 federal authorization. Um, they've just been able to collect a, a, a mountain of in really important monitoring data around those, those water resources and, uh, and, and been really willing to share them um, with, with other people in the, in the region. Yeah, well, I would, just, as a, just as my own personal note, from an outsider watching this, um, my sense was that they were generous in their use of the information that they had collected, and they were generous in their willingness to talk and negotiate. And I don't think that the compact could have been finalized had they not had uh, that generous spirit of trying to make something that was a fair, useful compact that would benefit the entire state. And um, I, I think that sometimes their contribution isn't acknowledged and that people think that it was one-sided, that they did it all for their benefit, but that's not really true. Um, but coming back to questions, and I'm just gonna tell the audience one more time, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A or the chat function or make a comment in Facebook we have one uh, question that just came in, um, and this comes from uh, Cheryl. And she says, are there well-defined in-stream flow requirements that are the basis for determining the amount of water that needs to be leased to make a meaningful difference for the aquatic environment? That's a great question. So do, we know what it, do we know what it takes to keep the stream healthy? Yeah, that's a great question, Cheryl. Um, in, in many cases, we do, um, but the, it's not consistent, right? It, it's context dependent on the, the type of stream, the um, amount of flow, the tributaries, the place, the elevation, the use, the, the human and other use of the, of the, of the stream or river. Um, Fish, Wildlife and Parks has a lot, and, and as does in the Clark Fork, as does NRDP, have a lot of what I call informal targets, uh, flow targets that during certain times of year, um, that are, 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 they look to, to meet in order to keep that stream healthy for fish. And I think that the, um, there's a lot of science to support those. They're all kind of science and data driven, but they also can be updated uh, over time as those streams change, as the fisheries and the makeup of the species change, um, they can change. And so there's a lot of work to be done there in, in how to do that. But I will say that there isn't kind of a one size fits all. And there's nothing legally that says like, this is, um, this is kind of the legal in-stream flow measurement for aquatic life. So many of the in-stream flow rights that I mentioned that are across the state um, that have been established um, are hopefully 
and especially the ones that were established by fish, wildlife, and parks, they came with that base of knowledge and that, that um, fisheries and aquatic ecology science data behind it to establish those. But also many of the ones that were kind of transitioned from agricultural rights to an in-stream flow right may have just been what would the amount of water that was in that right. And so there might be an in-stream flow right uh, legally that isn't exactly enough or, uh, for, for what that, that aquatic um, habitat and those fish species need. So it's kind, of, it's kind of across the board, very different and very context dependent, but it can all be yeah. figured out. Yeah. Well, and also um, one of the things that was news in, uh, locally is that there was a, there's a ditch that um, has a head gate here in Missoula that the city just bought recently. And um, so that will be a ditch that will not be diverting water out of the Clark Fork. Um, and again, that was, uh, I think, more a function of times change. The agricultural land use has changed. There's not as many crops. There's more houses on the land now, and there's not as many water users. But that is a, um, another irrigation water right that is going to not be diverting water from the Clark Fork from now on. And, you know, times change, uses change. And I think that's kind of a unique opportunity. But I think we can all be grateful that when it was available, um, it was good that someone was there able to grab it. No, that's just a, a comment. Yeah, yeah, no. All right, well, are there any other questions from the audience? Because we've, we've still got a few minutes left. If you have a question of Brian, um, he's here and he's available. Um, I just want to say once again, this was very, very interesting. Uh, you can't really be a Montanan and not have some sort of relationship to water, uh, whether you just walk by it, if you fish in it, float on it, boat on it. Um, it, it's part of our legacy. And I, I, I think the work that you're doing is helping to correct some things that have happened in the past. Um, I know our friends at the Clark Fork Coalition have taken tremendous strides on uh, restoring the Clark Fork River from the abuses that it suffered. But um, you can't be, I think, a Montanan and not care about water. And I think you've given us a lot to think about tonight on uh, the ways that you're caring about water. And I'm really grateful that the work that you're doing in research is involving your students. And this is a place, uh, university is a place where students can come and have an opportunity to do this kind of research with you. Um, so I think that's a, that's a plus for the university. And I'm, I'm grateful that you're doing that kind of work and that you're able to bring students into the work that you're doing. Um, I know that you care deeply about all of this. Yeah, I, I couldn't, none of this would be possible without my students. So I really appreciate, uh, it's really fun to work together with them on, on these projects. And they know they're so far ahead of me in uh, computational and technological things that I, I would be obsolete without many of my, my students. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about that. And, and you know, this is just a, uh, a snippet of some of the things that we're working on. And so I really appreciate the ability to share this with folks and um, just want to underscore that I'm always open to have a, have a further conversation about some of this stuff and look for other things that come out of this work uh, in the near future. Outstanding. Well, folks, this has been the fourth lecture in the Alumni Association Annual Community Lecture Series. Um, it's another great example of your university uh, going to work on all of our behalf and making our state and the place where we live and enjoy much better. So I want to thank uh, Brian Chapin one more time for the lecture tonight. Uh, join us again next week, next Tuesday at 7 o'clock and uh, we'll bring the next lecture to you. So thank you for tuning in and uh, see you next week.